This video is concerned with the question, what is a stochastic discount factor? Or in short, what is an SDF? Now, simplistically speaking, from the concept of net present value or discounted cash flow methods, you might know that you have to discount future cash flows with the proper discount rate. The discount rate is made of the time value of money and a risk premium, which compensates for holding non-diversifiable risk. Now, the SDF brings these concepts together and aggregates that into one quantity, namely into the SDF. So the stochastic process for the SDF is usually abbreviated with a capital M. While there are several hundreds of top-notch research papers on the SDF, its definition is very straightforward. We can say that a stochastic process is a stochastic discount factor if it satisfies the following three properties. Before I state these three properties, I want to highlight that the expectation operator that's going to show up is taken with regard to the empirical probability measure, or some say with regard to the physical probability measure. So here are the three properties of the stochastic discount factor. First, M0 is 1. Second, Mt is larger than 0 for all t with probability 1. And third, the product of Mt times Sit, as well as the product of MtRt, they need to be local martingales. Now, being a local martingale means that the process itself follows a random walk. So its conditional forecast into the future just coincides with its current value. Now, mathematically, here's what it means. It means that the conditional expectation of mt times sit, which we condition on little t, little t being smaller than cap t, that has to be equal to the current value, meaning to mt times sit. And the local martingale property for m times r implies or means that the conditional expectation as of today of m times r in the future is simply today's product, mt times rt. Now, you might wonder, why is the SDF such a big thing in finance? One reason is that the existence of an SDF implies that all assets that are priced with that SDF are free of arbitrage. So said differently, the market prices for specific systematic sources of risk are the same across different asset classes. For example, if inflation was a systematic risk factor, its priced in market price would be the same in stocks, in bonds, commodities and any other traded asset market. If we assume that assets are only subject to Brownian shocks, we can say that the SDFM solves the following Ito stochastic differential equation. Now, before I add some economic insights to the last expression, let's first look at the mathematical structure of that Ito SDE. It's notable that this is a separable Ito SDE. The solution will hence look as follows. If you can't follow that argument, I advise you revisit my video on how to solve separable Ito SDEs. But let's turn on to move forward to some economic insights. Now first, all sources of systematic risk must be part of DB. 
Hence, not surprisingly, we call DB to be the systematic sources of risk. So all these shocks in DB are compensated in equilibrium by a market price of risk. So what is the market price of risk then? Well, that's my second economic insight. The market price of risk vector is lambda t. So lambda t is of the same dimension than dbt. So its first entry quantifies the time t expected risk premium per unit of db1 risk. The second element of lambda t captures the time t expected risk premium for one unit exposure to the second element of db and so on. The t index on lambda highlights that it can be a stochastic process. Now, if you like to relate that to factor investing, you could say that lambda t is the ex ante expected factor risk premium for the next trading interval. Now, since lambda t is a column vector of ex ante expected risk premiums per unit of systematic risk, and since sigma is the volatility matrix of risky assets. It's not surprising to note that the expected risk premium for risky assets, denoted as the conditional expectation of DST over ST minus RT DT, equals the following expression, where mu T is the conditional expected instantaneous return of risky assets and sigma t is the instantaneous volatility matrix of the risky assets. So if you look at that equation again, you kind of note that the risk premiums or the expected risk premiums for the next time interval are nothing else than the market price vector for systematic risk exposure which is the lambda t times sigma t and sigma t contains the amount of systematic risk that the assets contain. Now that last equation also says that if you need expected returns for your asset allocation decision you can determine these as the product of expected factor premiums and the amount of factor risk in each asset class. Now that underlying rationale is the backbone of the multi-billion factor investing industry. In our course here, we have already talked about how to forecast volatility. As for the factor premiums, we've also talked about how to use the Kalman filter to back out the unobserved lambda t based on imprecise sensors. The difficulty in practical work is that the literature believes right now that lambda t is time varying and small in magnitude. So learning this value based on volatile realized factor premiums is a delicate task that is really sensitive to measurement errors. Now, so that is the perfect soup for potential p-hacking, data mining, and so on. So your takeaway should be to be cautious and to combine technical skills with dynamic asset pricing theory knowledge to steer your way through the clouded sky. Now my third economic insight is that if an asset market consists of K non-diversifiable risk factors, then you need at least k asset returns to span these k systematic risk factors. Now these assets in aggregate need to be exposed to all of these non-diversifiable risk factors. If that is the case, and only in that case, 
which by the way we call complete asset market, you will be able to invert out the expected factor premiums by means of the expected asset premiums and asset volatilities. Mathematically, it means under complete market, lambda t just coincides with sigma t to the minus one times the expected excess return of all assets. So it's the Sharpe ratio, basically. Now, if we look at that from a slightly different angle, that says that under complete asset markets, lambda t is uniquely determined conditional on knowing mu t and r t. And that makes the SDF unique. Now, I want to end this video with the summary of two properties that every arbitrage-free asset market shares. I will not prove these properties in that video here, yet I will post an additional video that contains the proof. Now here I just focus on the takeaway. So the first property of an arbitrage-free asset market is that the risk-free rate at time t is equivalent to minus the conditional expectation as of time t of dmt over mt. Now, if one were to look at the proof, one would see that this condition needs to hold to ensure that the third property of the SDF holds, namely m times r is a local martingale. The second important property of an asset free or of an arbitrage free asset market is that the ex ante expected asset risk premium is an equilibrium compensation for that part of asset risk that co moves with innovations in the SDF and only that part. Now, mathematically, it means that the conditional expected value of ds over s minus rt dt, so that's the ex ante expected risk premium of asset i, that needs to be the same than minus the instantaneous covariation of innovations to the SDF and innovations in the stock return. Now, given the structure of the SDF in the Brownian motion economy, that last expression can be rewritten as lambda transpose times the instantaneous covariation between the systematic shocks of the economy, which are here dB, and return innovations of asset I. It hence won't be too surprising to note in later videos that equilibrium models like the popular cap M assume a special stochastic discount factor. In short, the, disc, uh, the stochastic discount factor of the cap M assumes that non-diversifiable risk, which means the systematic risk, coincides with shocks to the market portfolio. And the respective cap M expected factor premiums will be the expected sharp ratio of the market portfolio. Now, if you want to see that relationship more explicitly, then I invite you to have a look at my video on the SDF and its relationship to factor models.